ain't taking those from nobody. Your superstars have off games. Follow us on social media uh, at Celtics Talk Weekly. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back into another episode of Celtics Talk Weekly podcast. I am your host, Rob Haytan. Joined with me is my co-host, Justin Lowe. We got so much to talk about, right? From the, the, the draftees, from the free agency signings, right? Jalen Brown, Damian Lillard. A lot going along, or a lot going on right now uh, in the Boston. Brad Stevens got a lot on his plate. Uh, a lot of guys who we could potentially uh, be going after. Grant Williams, so, so much. Before I get started, guys, I do want to say thank you so much for all the support you've been giving us. Um, our socials have been blowing up recently. If you're not following us on social media and you do like the content we produce, um, I highly recommend you subscribe to us because we have been grinding so hard to put out and produce content over the summer. Um, we've we've honestly been doing pretty solid with the podcast, I'd say. Uh, podcast is kind of like the thing where it's like it's so hit or miss throughout the season. The off season, we usually get it right because there's so much to talk about. I feel like it gets repetitive when you're talking about the same team once a week um, over the course of the season. You know, it's like, oh, well, Jalen Brown was great last week and <laughs> he's great again this week. So it's like uh, it's a little bit harder there. But, Justin, I mean, let's let's kick it off. Right. Because, again, so much to dive into, so much to talk about. Let's start with mm-hmm. Grant Williams, Boston does a three-team deal with the San Antonio Spurs. Grant Williams signs a four-year, $54 million contract, which he gets that extension he was looking for from Boston. Mind you, the same number, um, which was 13 and a half, uh, that was the number in which he was looking for an extension. Boston decided not to do it, sent him to be a restricted free agent, sign and trade. So Dallas receives Grant. Boston receives three second-round picks from Dallas. And San Antonio receives Reggie Bullock and a 2030 uh, pick swap with Dallas, which honestly I love for San Antonio. I think they did a phenomenal job um, at acquiring an expendable piece and receiving draft compensation, which could um, hold some value. Who knows where Luke is going to be in six years from now, seven years from now. So again, very good trade from San Antonio. But let's talk about the the Celtics position of it, Justin. Where, Where do you think Boston goes where do you think their thought process was with the grant williams move you essentially move grant williams salary off the team that 13 and a half million a year um clearly celtics didn't want to invest in grant williams in 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 what was it 54 million dollars um uh over the course of four years um i remember grant williams put something out about the whole taxpayer thing uh, you, you know, you're going to get more of that $54 million over in Dallas uh, than you were if you were here in Boston or L.A. Uh, with the whole tax paying and all of that kind of kind of the business, the ultra business side of things. Um, I think for Boston, uh, you know, Brad Stevens gets three second round picks, I believe it was out of that. They also get a seven million dollar trade exception um, from that deal. I don't know the exact number. I don't know if it's like 7.2 or 6.9 or whatever it is, but uh, that's some flexibility the Celtics can kind of dabble with and, and, and see who they can uh, go out and acquire. I, you know, we're going to touch base on this later when we talk about Brown and Damian Lillard and all that, but you know, the Celtics don't really need any pizzazz. Like they need some solid bench pieces, which I think, you know, we go and we talk about Brissett that we'll, I'm sure we'll touch on later. That's a very solid bench piece. So that $7 million trade exception gives Boston along with the mid-level exception. I believe they have a, I, I believe from draft night, they got a mid-level exception. So, you know, it gives Boston a lot of flexibility. Uh, it gives Danny, a- or excuse me, it gives Brad wow. Stevens a lot of flexibility wow. to work with the draft picks i don't know i don't know why i said that i'm just so accustomed. yeah i make that I think, same mistake i think i think in in i said this to you off camera and i'm gonna say it to you right here on camera i, I think before i go out and i really uh judge brad stevens on uh, we just lost grant williams for second round picks like there's gonna be a reason right like there's gonna be a reason brad stevens took you know, turn one first round pick into five second round picks, turn Grant Williams into three second round picks, turn smart into two second rounds. And don't forget, we have a first round pick golden States first round. pick. So like, I don't know, like, like there's gotta be something going on here, whether that's now, whether that's 
October, whether that's at the trade deadline, something has to be brewing in the back of uh, Brad Stevens' mind. So this is not a cop-out at all, Rob. Give me a little bit to process this and give me a little bit to see exactly what Brad Stevens is doing behind the scenes before I make this whole, oh, we really lost Grant for three draft picks. Like this was a terrible right. trade. This right horrible. Because these draft picks could essentially land us a guy – I don't want to put names out there, like not officially, but like this could land us a guy like Pascal Siakam. It could land us a guy. We have our, we have a Chris F. Porzingis, the name Carl Anthony Towns that floats around that could get us a guy like him that could get us a wing like OG Ananobi. Uh, you know, so the list goes on. It gives the Celtics a lot of flexibility. You do lose a lot of the heart and soul in Grant Williams and Marcus Smart in these two deals. But again, there has to be something up Brad Stevens' sleeve. Yeah. So, I look at the two moves so far, and obviously there's been a couple, but the two big moves, which um, was losing Grant, or not losing, but getting rid of Grant and Marcus Smart. Yeah. The, the What's been going out and what's been coming in, in my opinion, has a common trend to it. What's been going out has been slow half court presence offense and smaller wingspan and less athletic guys what's been coming in is fast pace long wingspan great defenders obviously grant and smart are two phenomenal defenders however they don't get out and run like these guys who we are bringing in do so when i look at this grant trade do I like it right now? No, I don't. But it opens the gates and opens an opportunity up for Boston to, in my opinion, make a significant upgrade um, at, the, at the position. I, I don't think Grant Williams was someone you had to bring back. Um, he was a guy I loved, great guy, great personality. But he was an expendable piece, in my opinion. And we all kind of knew it. Like I wasn't surprised. It was something throughout the course of the season where you're like, all right, Boston, Grant's time in Boston is probably up. Um, and with the second smart got dealt, you figured, all right, the core they tried to keep together is probably going to get a little messy and they're probably going to move some pieces around um, because of what's resulted from that. So the Grant move, again, I think I could like it that that uh that player that trade player exception TPE could come in big a name I love is Sadiq Bay, what he brings mm. again, uh long athletic solid defender I, I do think his shot selection needs some work, but I think a guy like that if you can buy him into winning culture, he starts looking up those uh, passing up those looks, so, in regards to the grant I, I'd give us a a, a B minus C plus, uh trade grade in my opinion. Uh, just because on paper, X's and O's, you're like, ugh, not the best. Could have gotten a, right. get a first for Grant. But if you look at the big overall picture, the vision, uh, I think Brad's vision right now is to acquire fast, lengthy, and, and, and quick players that can get out and run. And I, I think, unfortunately, Grant Williams didn't fit that. Um, but guys like Jordan Walsh and O'Shea Brissett, who I want to talk about, um, do fit that. Brissett averaged six points per game last year for Indy. Um, he's a guy in which I think he is a pace in a space and pace type of player. So when I say space and pace, what he does isn't going to be wow. He's not going to give you 30. He's not going to give you 25. But he's going to space the floor properly and play at the perfect pace in which you are looking for him to play. Um, mm. I think he has a real opportunity to get slotted in and play some solid minutes. I think he is capable of playing solid minutes at that three position for Boston. You got three or two. He can. He, he's a decent shooter. He's a solid shooter. He's a very athletic wing. And again, he fits that description that Brad is clearly going for um, in, in, in the type of offense we're going to be running. I want to say one thing before I move on to Brissett. I just want to say one quick thing with the whole Brad Stevens situation and these two moves that he made. First and foremost, we made a very ballsy move to start off this offseason, and that ballsy move was trading away the heart and soul of the franchise. Marcus Smart traded him away, got draft picks. Then he was involved in that three-team deal where we had uh, Chris F. Porzingis come in. Porzingis was on a contract year. He was, you know, he needed to be extended. 
you know, so, you know, you look at it and you go, first of all, not only did we get Chris Tapps Porzingis, but right. we were able to extend him and we were ex- able to extend him to a cheaper cost of what he, the maximum he could have gotten. I believe it was 77. I believe we got him for 60. So we saved about between 15 and $17 million on an extension. Correct. My yes. point is, is Brad Stevens would not make that move, you know, not dish out Marcus Smart, the heart and soul. If he didn't believe that there was a plan with Chris Saps Porzingis, right? Like if Porzingis was just one year rental, one hit wonder type of deal, he would not have made that move, right? right? So I feel as if that's a very high risk to take. Brad took that risk. We right, we talk about you have to take risks sometimes in order to win. And Brad Stevens took a risk. Chris Saps Porzingis not only comes to Boston, not only resigns. He resigns seventeen million dollars cheaper than what he could have gotten. Okay, and then now you look at the Grant Williams situation. We go, oh, Grant Williams. You know the casual eye. We see Grant Williams uh, going out, and then nothing really coming back in other than draft compensation. We're like, oh, you know, maybe there's a plan behind that. Let's just keep that in the back of our heads. I think, I think not only just for you and I, just think in general for the for the people who are so quick to kind of snap and, you know, they, they just read the first headline. There has to be something planned in my opinion for Brad Stevens. And when it hits, it's going to hit hard. And I really truly believe that Brad Stevens is as the kids say, cooking up something. I really truly, <laughs> truly believe in that. And um, I, I just think that's a point I wanted to get across, uh, but moving on to O'Shea Brissett, that was kind of a, a, you know, free agency, uh, the first day of free agency or second day, it was kind of like we were hearing these names, Terrence Davis, you know, we were hearing some, you know, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of different names, but it, it ended up being O'Shea Brissett out of Indiana, I Indiana. believe it was. Um, dude, freak athlete. I mean, this guy is able to get downhill, as you said, very, right. very fast paced, energetic player on both ends of the floor. He's a six, six, seven wing. He can stretch the floor. He had a little bit of an off shooting year last year, but uh, the year before that, I mean, unbelievable. So it's really like, and we're going to talk about it with Jordan Walsh as well. Like if these two guys are able to consistently hit their jump shots, particularly behind that three point arc where they can shoot those two pieces, O'Shea Bursat especially are going to be unbelievably huge for this team. And I think that people are name hunting right now, Rob. People are looking at the Damian Lillards and the and the Pascal Siakams and the James Hardens. Like they're not looking at what they should be looking at. If you're a Boston Celtics fan, you should be looking at these O'Shea Bursats. You should be looking at these, hey, who knows, Terrence Ross, Jeff Greens, like these little pieces that right are going to be put together and to be able to play alongside. Because I mentioned this earlier too off camera. We have Jalen Brown. We have Jason Tatum. We have Chris Steph Porzingis. We have all the star power. Now we need pieces to go around it that could fit correctly. I know that was a lot of talking at once, but I I know you're (laughs) in the the same boat as me. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like you look at how – I'm sorry, I have gum in. I got to take it out. I hate to do this. (laughs) Uh, You look at how – Boss again, how Boston's constructed the roster. I have my Damian Lillard take. I'm going to give that later on in this episode. As for Brissett, I love the signing. You mm-hmm. don't. You made a great point. You don't need to lean closer to the Phoenix Sun style of ball, the the, the 2021 Brooklyn Nets style of ball, right? The you see these teams, the 2022 Lakers. You see these teams just Warriors. just build talent in hall talent and think to yourselves this gotta work look at the talent the league has expanded into a almost a properly you need to have a proper system in a certain style of play in which that works again last episode i dove into the previous finals winners i'm gonna do it again today 2023 dallas or i'm sorry whoa whoa 2023 denver um Jokic, superstar. Murray, not a superstar. Murray's a phenomenal player, phenomenal talent, an amazing offensive uh, scorer, but he's not an all-NBA caliber player right now. He could be, right? Never know. However, right now, he he wasn't even an all-star. 
So you see that. You got, okay, you got MPJ, you got Aaron Gordon. They play their roles. MPJ is a shot maker when he needs to be a shot maker. And Aaron mm. Gordon is going to play some solid defense and kind of plays the pace and uh, the space and pace type of role where he's right. going to score if you need him to score. He's going to do it pretty well and efficiently, but he doesn't need to. Let's take a look at the 2022 Warriors, right? Again, Steph Curry. They have their guy, number one guy, Steph Curry. Behind that, Clay Thompson. Was he really the second best player? Probably not. Jordan Poole, Draymond Green, right? So it is a it is a number, a clear cut number one, and everyone plays their roles nicely. 20, let's 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 head over to 2021 Milwaukee Bucks, because again, I'm gonna keep going with this. Giannis, their guy. Drew Holiday could have been all NBA this year. Jalen Brown-esque, but obviously Brown's much better, but you kind of see how they had a similar... So it's like 2020 Lakers, they had that LeBron AD, but outside of LeBron and AD, it was just a really well-built team. 2019 Raptors, same thing. Just a really well-built team. So, I mean, obviously you go back to the 2018 Warriors and you kind of lose that. Um, However... That is what wins. It's obvious that the recipe to winning right now in the NBA is you have to have a properly built team that plays off of each other. That is what Brad, I think, is trying to do. You look at the move. Smart going out. Gives the ball to Jason Tatum. It puts it in his hands more. I like that. Moving Grant Williams. It opens up an expendable pieces in in those picks and that cap flexibility to go out and get a guy that fits well. Can't fit well here. But... I think right now with this second apron, and I listened to this in the Bill Simmons podcast, which I've been really into recently, right? What this second apron now does for teams is it honestly, it's like it's a real business now. You know, once you hit a certain age in the industry, whatever industry it might be, they're thinking, all right, we can pay a younger guy a lot cheaper money to do what you're doing and maybe even more. Grant Williams for $54 million, what he does, you can go and find. And obviously, you got to ask, well, can you find that right now? You probably can. You might have that in the rookie Jordan Walsh. Offensively, shooting-wise, I don't think he's going to be there yet this season. However, I think that defensively, he's going to bring that same presence, and I think he brings another level to your uh, team athletically. Um, so, yeah, look at that. that. That's really where my point is right now. Right? I kind of went a little off topic, but... That's where my that that's where I'm sitting at with the Boston Celtics and their roster construction is that you got Tatum as your one and you have Brown as your two. Cuz that that's what it is. Tatum's the one, Brown's the two. I, I love the two of them. Tatum's just the, a little bit better all around. He's I think he's a better playmaker and a better passer, so that that guy should be your number one. Um you got Brown you got Tatum Brown, and then you got Porzingis to round out the three, who's going to play his role pretty well. And then again, you got guys that just play their role. Derek White, Malcolm Brogdon, Al Horford, Robert Williams, Peyton. Those are guys that just are going to play their role. They're not going to try to do too much. They're not going to demand the ball a lot. They are just going to feed off of what the, two, the top two or three give them. And that, I think, is a new aspect in which we have now in Boston. And I think Brad is trying to build on that. Hmm. You know what won't do that, Justin? That's that. Is getting Damian Lillard. And yeah. I've I'm reading all over the place. Honestly, right now the Damian Lillard take, it's a mess. The the Damian Lillard situation is such a mess right now. Um it, I mean, this whole demanding his way to Miami thing and his agent calling up teams and saying, listen, you can trade for Dame, but he's going to be unhappy in an unpleasant time and it's not worth it. It's childish. It is. It's really childish. Um, this is a guy who hasn't ran from the grind his whole career, right? He has been this whole, I'm going to be the grind and do it the hard way. And I think it's funny you have him sitting here like, I only want to play for the defending Eastern Conference Finals champions. Right. That's funny to me. Um as, as to what Boston should do with the Dame situation, I think Brad has made it clear. And listen, when you have the ball, ball, ball things, I think that's your inside source, in my opinion, in terms of getting the, the, the ins and outs of Boston. Shams is, right, I think Brad is, is making it clear to the media, Brown isn't an expendable piece. They're not trading him. They're looking to extend him. That's what every report has been, Justin. Every single one. And I think Brad has done that to say, listen, last offseason, his name was thrown around in trade talks. It, he ma- it made him unhappy. This offseason, I'm going to make it clear, Jalen Brown's getting extended. Okay, that's off the table, right? Done. Jalen Brown, staying. 
I refuse to, to even act as if he's going to leave because no reports or no signs has indicated that's going to happen. Now yeah. let's look at the opportunity in which, sorry, real quick. Actually, you know what? I want to hear your Brown take first because I want to talk about a world in which if we can get Dane without trading Brown. But first, let me hear Brown. No, I, I, I said my I, I stand by my Jalen Brown take that I had last week. I, I think Boston and, and Jalen Brown want to work together. I think uh, Jalen Brown wants to be here. I think G, I think the Celtics want Jalen Brown to be here. Uh, you know, we uh, when we advertised the podcast last week, uh, that was one of our clips. Um, and one of our promos was us talking about Jalen Brown, and I just saw some comments. Uh, Clearly, Boston doesn't want Jalen Brown if they, they haven't given him the extension yet. Going back to what I said earlier about the the, the, the smart trade and, and the grant trade, there's so much that we don't know. There's so much that we don't know that's going on behind the scenes right now. One of those is why we haven't re-signed Jalen Brown to that uh, that that super max contract that he, he was eligible for nine days ago on July 1st. I think – you know, you look at one thing and, and you look at the Celtics and I, I really think that Jalen Brown is everything this franchise wants. Uh, he can play defense. He can play offense. He's, he's a freakish athlete. He can score. He can defend. Dude can't dribble for his life. But that's, again, as I mentioned last week, that's fixable. Um, again, I, I just think Jalen Brown wants to be here in Boston, wants Jalen Brown to be here, Robin. To me, to me. I don't think you go after a guy like Damian Lillard. You have, I mentioned it earlier, you have your three guys. You have your three uh, all-star superstars, whatever you want to call them. You have them. You don't need Damian Lillard. Right. And you especially so, don't need to give up more than three to four pieces for Damian Lillard. Correct. I, I think the Dame situation is so interesting because there's this world in which Dame only wants Miami. Right. Right. And there's this world where Portland has made it clear that, listen, they want to do the best thing for their franchise moving forward. They're not looking just to, unfortunately, Dame shouldn't have signed the contract extension if you weren't to pick where he played. That's kind of what I'm getting from, or what I'm getting, right. uh, like, what reading. My thing is, if Boston can land Dame in a three-team deal, where there's a world where you give up some picks in Brogdon, Brogdon for Dame, and there's a third team that works in there where the caps work and there's like other things go right. Where like, that's what, that's the return. Then it's like, okay, well, yeah, because you're replacing Malcolm Brogdon with Damian Lillard. Sure. But is that even a realistic option? Probably not. I think there's a world in which sure you could get Damian Lillard without trading Jalen Brown with the help of a third team with giving up probably Brogdon Pritchard, and Robert Williams, but then you sit there, right? Say you do that in picks, probably three or four picks too. You sit there and you're thinking, all right, well, let's look at the team right now. Dame at the one, Brown at the two, Tatum at the three, Porzingis at the four, or Horford at the four, maybe Brissett at the four, Zingod at the five. Off the bench, you have Derek White. Mm. And yeah, it's just like, it's, and then what else? And then I, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, well, yeah. Yeah, it's it, it sounds really nice, and it could win a title. It could, right? That's a championship-caliber team, yes. But it, it just, again, it scares me because of what history of the NBA tells me. That won't work. There's only 100% of usage to go out. Tatum needs 30, Brown needs 30, Dame needs 30. You got 10% left to give. Right. You got 10%, and Porzingis needs 25. 20 so it's like I look at the options and I'm thinking to myself, well, are you, if you make the Dame deal, are you even getting – You all right, sure, you get Dame, but are you really getting Dame? Because his usage is going to go down. Brown's usage goes down. Tatum's usage goes down. So it's like, yeah, more, more talent the better in theory on 2K, but you're not doing that. you got to build a championship team. And the past five years, where the NBA is going, the direction we're headed is – you get guys that play their roles properly. And I think if you make the move for Damian Lillard, you lose that, that ab ability to get guys that play their roles properly. I don't think that's the direction Brad's looking for. I don't think that's the direction Brad should go. I don't think that that's the direction Brad should go either. 
I think there's no package in which uh, Boston walks away winners, if I'm being 100% honest with you. And, and that might sound so crazy, but I'm not going to sit here and trade Jalen Brown for Damian Lillard. Um, first of all, I've mentioned it. Jalen Brown, other than Tatum, that's the centerpiece of your franchise right there. Like, Brown's, what, 26? He still has I don't so even, much. That's not even a – a, a, a thought in my mind quite frankly that there has been no indication that that's going to happen so i don't even like you know what i'm saying the the package that i saw that really made me not want damian lillard not that i don't like him but i saw a package of malcolm Bogdan. i don't like him <laughs> i'll say it i don't malcolm like Bogdan. him who is it brogdon white robert williams and like three first round picks that is the biggest no-no. I'm not talking about the picks. I'm not talking about Brogdon. I'm talking about White and Robert Williams. Now I get it. Robert Williams, he's injury prone. He's not in the lineup often. But when he is in the lineup, statistically, the Celtics are the best team in the league. Not one of the. He is, they are the best team in the league. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, that's a lot to give up for one guy in Damian Lillard. I know he's a sensational talent, but for a guy that doesn't want to be in Boston, why would you give all that up if you're Boston? Derek White's not that old, guys. Derek White's still young. 29. 29 years old. Four, four years younger. Finally, you know, he's only been here a year and a half, but he was arguably one of the best play- – not arguably, he was one of the best Celtics players last season, especially throughout the, uh, the playoffs – I don't know, man. I'm not doing the Dame to Boston. I'm not doing anything to do with Damian Lillard to Boston. There's reports, conflicting reports, saying that Tatum and the Celtics are targeting Damian Lillard. There's reports now saying that uh, Boston has pulled out of the sweepstakes. There's just conflicting reports left and right. And I I, I threaded this this morning, and and I mean every word I say about this. That's new. What's that? The threaded this. I, I threaded like this. It? This. Yeah. Like it? I, I kind of like it. I kind of like it. I do not. <laughs> I do not. I or no, I do. I think that this Damian Lillard situation, Rob, is embarrassing. I use yeah. that word with yeah, full yeah. emphasis. Embarrassing. No, I, think right. I think this I think whole situation right. is embarrassing. I think again, off principle. If there's a world where you can dump Brogdon in four or five picks to get Dame. Financially, if you can make that work, you would be dumb not to. In theory, I don't think there's a world where that's going to be on the table. And I think, Justin, I think you nailed it on the head. There's a saying in the NBA that you don't trade a dollar for four quarters. You don't trade a Damian Lillard for Derek White and, and Robert Williams, right? But I don't think White's a quarter. I, I can really get into it. I think he's 50. <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that. So, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. right, again, it gets back to what I'm saying. I think, yes, there is a world where you can get Damian Lillard without trading Brown and keeping Porzingis and keeping Jason Tatum. But, but at what cost? But but at what cost? You, you get an old guard who, again, clearly is just uh, – is really just throwing a temper tantrum, it almost seems, uh, in this process. And you just – it's not needed. It's not – you think necessary. What does Boston need? A star isn't one of them. And why would you fill in a gap? Why would you go for someone that's not a team need? Especially when you have the star power. What does Miami need? A star. What does New York need? A star. What does Philly need right now with the Harden situation? A star. What does Portland not need? A star. What does Houston not need? Or what does Houston need? A star. What does Boston need? Not a star. They don't need a star. They have them. So it's like you sit here and you read these reports and maybe Brad wants to do it. Maybe he doesn't. Again, the the reports have been so conflicting, but you don't need a star. You have two of them and arguably three of them. Mm -hmm. So again, don't do it. That's why I think it's, I think it's so important to not name watch. Like, I think that's like, like the whole O'Shea Brissett and, and, and then the Danilo Banton uh, moves and then the Jordan Walsh move, like those aren't big names, but those are pieces. And when you're building a championship team, you need puzzle pieces. 
Do you think, and I'm not comparing this team to the 08 team, I'm really not, but do you think 20 years ago when there were Celtics fans our age or, you know, whatever, 15, whatever, years ago, you think there were Celtics fans our age saying, like, oh, my God, like James Posey, Leon Poe, Brian Scalabrini, Eddie House, like, we're tight, like, we're, that's, you know, boom. No, they weren't. They were focused on the KGs and the Ray Allens, the Pierce, the Rondos. That's, what you that's who they were focused on. But you need those guys. You need your, you need your Posey. You need your Poe. You need your house. You need, uh, you know, your Cassell, right? Like you need those guys, right? Those are energy lifters. Those are needle, those are needle threaders. Those are, you know, that pushes you to yeah. success. That's not going to be, that's not going to put you over the top, but it can get you there. I think it's funny because you see all these teams trying to do the big three, what Boston did, what Miami did. I don't know. Have you even seen a big three? Obviously you had a big three, maybe in Chicago. I, I'd consider that more as a duo. I don't know if Scotty or I'm sorry. I don't know if Dennis is a big three. Um, look at, look at the 08 team. Let's look at the 2008 Boston Celtics. Boston brought over Garnett and, uh, and Ray Allen in a trade. In theory, that's what teams are trying to replicate, but you can't because you look at the Boston Celtics in 2008 and there were clear rule changes that took place. Ray Allen gave up his 26 points per game and completely changed his game to a spot up catch and shoot shooter. He stepped into that scoring role when Pierce wasn't there, like we saw in 2009 against the Bulls. Or I'm sorry, when KG wasn't there, but he stepped up in the number two role when he had to. But he changed his role. He accepted the fact, listen, I've been in this league for 10 years now. I would love it. I need a ring. That's the last thing I'm missing. I'm going to make a sacrifice. Kevin Garnett, same thing. This is the MVP of the, 04, of the 2004 NBA season. The MVP, the most valuable player, Justin. And he was okay with taking a role change. He went from the best player on the team, where everyone kind of knew in 08 that Garnett was the best guy on the team, right? They knew it. But he went to the defensive anchor. And then you had Paul Pierce, the score, the buck getter. That's who was the off was running through, was Paul Pierce. So I think it's fun to look at these guys. Well, you know, the big three, like be in Durant and Booker. It's like, all right, Bill Durant, Booker. Who's going to be the defensive anchor? Who's going to be the go scorer? And who's going to be the sacrifice guy that is just filling in the role when he needs to fill? going to do it because it's clear again right. I, shall i bring up the heat 2012 uh, let's do it. lebron was the go-to guy dwayne wade took probably the biggest role change there's been in nba history two years prior to lebron james getting to miami dwayne wade was arguably the one of the best players in the league if not the best player in 09 average 30 plus that dude was a le legit legit mvp candidate just two years prior and then Chris Bosh, who was the, I'm going to give you what I can give you. I'm going to be the end defensively. I'm going to knock down big shots when the ball comes my way. Sacrifice. That's what it takes to develop and use a big three. Why do you think hmm. these uh, big threes that teams are constructing aren't working? It's because where's the sacrifice? So it's right. funny. You think Dame. Why would I bring Dame in? Who's going to sacrifice? Tate, I don't want Tatum sacrifice, and I don't want Jalen Brown sacrificing. Because we are at our best when they're at their best, right? The way they play when we're at our best, when they're playing their brand of basketball. So what, you're trading for the guy that's going to sacrifice in Dame? Okay, well, what can Dame give you sacrificing? He is a six undersized guard. Maybe he turns into the playmaker. But again, you want the ball in Tatum's hands. And then you got Porzingis to fit into the So what now is Porzingis just what? You traded defensive anchor for what? A more injury-prone defensive anchor? It just – there's no logistics behind that, Justin. And I think if you look at the 08 Celtics, you look at the 12 Heat, those are perfect examples. That's how you build a big three. You don't have – I think you have your big three um, with Porzingis, Brown, and Tatum. And I think there's going to be some sacrifice, and I think there's going to be playing off of that. So you ask me, we're set in Boston. You don't need Damian Lillard. It's not it, the big three thing doesn't mm -hmm. work. It takes a rare type of players, rare breed of players to play off of each other at that level.
again, you have what you need, right? Now it's all about like your main, your main puzzle pieces are right there. Like you're like the puzzle's almost finished, right? Like, you know, when you're scurrying and you're looking for the final few puzzle pieces, like it's, you know, those are the puzzle pieces that finish the job. Those are the puzzle pieces that make the puzzle work. Bringing in guys like these, like, again, like O'Shea Brissett, uh, he fits the system very well. He can space the floor. He can play quick. He can shoot the ball. He can play defense. Like, the guy can do everything. Something like Banton, young player, he can do everything. Need these guys to be consistent. We look at Jordan Walsh. Clearly, Brad Stevens sees something in Jordan Walsh if you're signing him to a four-year, $7.6 million deal, right? Like, clearly, when that 38, uh, 38 that second-round 38 pick – means something to this franchise if you're keeping them around for four years, right? So, like, those are puzzle pieces, Rob. You know what, though? I'm going to say this. I don't think we're better right now where we stand no. than we were last no. year. So, no. yes, those brissette, those were the right fill-in pieces, but I still think there are moves that need to be made um, to get this team better than they were last year. Right. I think they were in-house changes. Again, I'd hate to go back to smart. And I'm not bad mouthing, mouthing smart, but I think that, I mean, I was smart, checked himself into a basketball game last season, smart, got into the game, walked up to the scores table and without the coach telling him to, he subbed into the game, Justin, right? That's dysfunction. I hate to say it as much as I love Marcus smart. There was dysfunction in how that, that team operated smart was simply just not good enough to do that. And really, I don't even want my superstar doing that. Mm. The coach calls the shots. I, I hate to say it, but there was dysfunction with Marcus Smart being in Boston. There just was. So I do think they have – Brad has made progress. They need something else. Sadiq Bey, right? That's a name I really like. OG Ananobi. I think Pascal is like – even Ananobi – is like a really big ticket. If you get one of those two, I'm like ecstatic. Like, oh my God, give us the trophy now. Because again, I think they play off of each other. I don't think you need a Pascal Siakam level player. I don't even know if you need an OG on an Obi type of player. You do need a, 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 a player, a playoff caliber player though. A player that will be in your playoff rotation. Because right now as it is, it's White at the one, Brown at the two, Tatum at the three, Porzingis at the four. Rob at the five, vice versa. Off the bench, you got Brogdon. You got Pritchard. You got Horford. That's an eight man. It's a solid eight man, mind you. Um, Hauser is a name. Maybe you see Hauser. Brissett, maybe Hauser and Brissett in the playoffs. I'm not huge on. Pritchard and Brogdon off the bench. Two guards, not huge on. So again, I think there are moves to be made. Um, and I think they're going to be made. I don't think that's going to be made tomorrow, quite frankly. I don't think it's going to be made today. Uh, I do think Brad Stevens needs to make uh, some some moves to get a playoff rotational player. I think it will happen. Who? Like, again, I, I got threw out a couple names who I like. But we'll see because the direction that we're headed is good. I like it. I think there was, again, some dysfunction call me crazy in that C's locker room and how it operated. I don't th I think everyone liked each other, quite frankly. I do, but I, I do think there was some dysfunction and I do think the ball wasn't in Tatum's hands enough. How that man facilitated the ball in games four, five, and six against the heat, how he operated the offense was special. He showed that, listen, I can be a, a dissect the defense type of player game five against the Miami heat in the Eastern conference finals, Justin, might have been his best overall performance in his career. And I say that and you think to yourself, what? Not 51 against Philly? Not 46 against Milwaukee? Not 50, uh, 53 against the Nets? But Jason Tatum's Game 5 versus the Miami Heat. I'm, I'm pulling it up right here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Hold on. May 25th. Let's see. Yes, here it is. Jason Tatum, 22 points, 12 rebounds, 9 assists, plus 17, plus minus. 
That's a complete game. He took 20 shots. Jalen Brown led the team in scoring. He shot 35% from the floor, which is like, oof, right? Robbie, you're kind of crazy. Rob, what the, what the hell are you talking about? His best game in his career. But when you watch that game, he had complete control of it. Yeah. They, like you knew the Celtics were going to win the game because of how he was playing. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's not even the correct game five. <laughs> that's not even the correct. That's, that's funny because I think his game five, 2023 has identical stats. I'm sorry. I got to be better. Let me get this real quick. I was going to say the shooting percentage is like, I don't think that's right. This is when he started hitting those shots and those mid-range shots in the fourth. And he kind of – he came in and he just kind of – he just balled. I remember that game specifically because I was like, dude, I was mad at Missoula because Celtics made – like they kind of were down and then they made yeah. it come back. And All right. He didn't have him in the fourth. So game five, even – literally, that's really weird. It's identical, but it was a better complete game. All right. 21 points, 8 rebounds, 11 assists. That's That makes a lot more sense to me. Shot 50% from the floor. He did struggle from 3, but that happens. Plus 19, plus minus. Yeah. 11 assists. He had 4 turnovers, but that's not that bad uh, when, you're, when you're dishing out 11 assists. Again, you knew they were going to win. He had right. control. He was operating right. the offense. Miami went into that zone. Tatum was dissecting it. That is why I think Boston has the chance with this roster to maybe be better. They need a piece, but that's why I think Boston is going to be so special next season is because mm. when you let Jason Tatum operate the offense, good things happen. I think there were too many times where Marcus Smart was running the show. So that's where I'm at. I agree. I think we need to make another, another move, add, someone, add a playoff rotation guy, probably using Brogdon. Hate to say it, but I'm okay with Pritchard playing back up for minutes. I am. Um, and let Tatum run the show. I think that's your ticket to the to the banner 18. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll see. We still the crazy thing about this is that so much has happened and we're only in the first week of July. Like so, like, like there's still a lot of offseason left. We haven't even gotten Harden, to summer league. Harden hasn't yet. been like, traded, Dame needs to be traded. There's just a lot of moves, not only in the Celtics organization, just in general. Like we're still so early in the off season, but uh, he, this off season, I feel like, uh, has been the most productive this fast, uh, at least in recent years. Uh, but you know, who knows, Rob? We'll see. I mean, we still next week we could be talking about um, a totally different roster. I mean, we didn't have uh, O'Shea last week. We didn't have Banton last week. We didn't have Walsh. You know, signed to that four-year deal. You know, right. Brown was kind of more thrown into the Dame situation than he is compared <laughs> to right now. So, you know, these weeks, these, you know, just the the stuff that happens within 24 hours, let alone seven days a week, it, it's just absolutely insane. Watch, we're going to we're gonna click off of this and something big is going to happen like it just <laughs> always does. Yeah, no, you're right. And again, Boston's heading in the right direction. That's what's right. important. Smart, those, Smart and Grant, those moves needed to be made. I, I think they both try to play a role much bigger than what they were. I think Brad saw right through that, and Brad made the moves. Love both of them. Two guys who embraced Boston. Two guys who played their absolute heart out on the on the parquet. Grant's Game 7 against Milwaukee is still a top three Celtics moment I saw in person. But it, there were moves that needed to be made. They just had to. I think when you've made it to the conference finals, what is it, six of the last eight years, five of the last seven years, and you don't come out on top in any of them in terms of a title, that's Brad Stevens again. Got to take those risks, right, Rob? Like, yeah. it's been seven years of making it to the conference finals, or, you know, five of the last seven years in falling up short. Yeah, we got to the NBA finals. What happened? We didn't win. The, the goal wasn't completed. So I think, unfortunately, it's hard to see guys like Grant and, and, and Smart go who have been here for so many years. Had to happen. But it had to happen. And not going to lie, I'd much rather it happen to a guy like Grant Williams and Marcus Smart, although Smart's one of my favorite Celtics of all time, than to see Brown and or Tatum Damn. walk out that door. So I, I think the moves were made with right intention and – 
I think there's still a lot more moves to be made. As I've said, we could be in this position a week from now, Rob, talking yeah. about a yeah. totally different roster, totally different players. Who knows? Maybe even we add another coach or two onto the coaching staff because we've been very active at that. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot to cover. Uh, I would probably tell everybody, honestly, not this is no plug, but seriously, stay tuned to our social medias because <laughs> – this season is very – this offseason is very early, but it's in full swing. Yeah. Um, again, two players who were trying to play a role that they couldn't play. They were trying to fit into a bigger role. Smart thought he was the third best player. Fortunately, he wasn't, and he tried to play that role, and he tried to make a big three with him, Brown, and Tatum, and I love Smart so much. Again, he's the reason I love the Boston Celtics. He is the reason I love do talking basketball. He is the reason I play basketball. Like, like, I love Marcus Smart, but it's like when you sit down, you look at it, it's like it had to happen. Right. This team's heading in the right direction. We're going we're gonna to get there. But that's all we got for you guys today. Thank you so much for listening in, joining us in again. You guys have been killing it. Go follow us on Thread. It's new. Justin said Thread it tonight, and I absolutely loved it. I can get used to that. Um, it's funny. Instagram jumped on the opportunity as soon as Twitter added that little uh, restriction um, in subscription based on how many tweets you can see a day. Instagram Ooh. said, well, hold on. Let me give you a free version of Twitter. They did a great job with Thread. Uh, we're, we're actually doing pretty well. I think we have 700 followers in the first day. Uh, on yeah, thread yeah. so we're doing well again thank you guys couldn't be here without you um thank you so much for listening and i'm rob co-host justin we're signing go off guys merch. go buy our merch and until next time go seize <laughs>